I want to start this morning with a, um, a classic children's story, and it is a story about selfless love and a deep longing for relationship, and many of you know this story well. It's called The Giving Tree. Here we go. Once there was a tree, and she loved a little boy. And every day the boy would come. And he would gather her leaves. And make them into crowns and play king of the forest. He would climb up her trunk. And swing from her branches. And eat apples. And they would play hide and go seek. I just love the little pointing. And when he was tired, he would sleep in her shade. And the boy loved the tree very much. And the tree was happy. But time went by. And the boy grew older. And the tree was often alone. Then one day, the boy came to the tree, and the tree said, Come, boy, come and climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and eat apples and play in my shade and be happy. I'm too big to climb and play, said the boy. I want to buy things and have fun. I want some money. Can you give me some money? I'm sorry, said the tree, but I have no money. I have only leaves and apples. Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money, and you will be happy. And so the boy climbed up the tree and gathered her apples and carried them away. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And the tree was sad. And then one day the boy came back and the, and the tree shook with joy. She said, come boy, climb up my trunk and swing from my branches and be happy. I'm too busy to climb trees, said the boy. I want a house to keep me warm. I want a wife, and I want children, and and so I need a house. Can you give me a house? I have no house, said the tree. The forest is my house, but you may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy. And so the boy cut off her branches and carried them away to build his house. And the tree was happy. But the boy stayed away for a long time. And when he came back, the tree was so happy she could hardly speak. Come, boy, she whispered. Come and play. I'm too old and sad to play, said the boy. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. Can you give me a boat? Cut down my trunk and make a boat, said the tree. Then you can sail away and be happy. And so the boy cut down her trunk and made a boat and sailed away. And the tree was happy, but not really. And after a long time, the boy came back again. I'm sorry, boy, said the tree, but I have nothing left to give you. My my apples are gone. My teeth are too weak for apples, said the boy. My branches are gone, said the tree. You cannot swing on them. I'm too old to swing on branches, said the boy. My trunk is gone, said the tree. You, You cannot climb. I'm too tired to climb, said the boy. I'm sorry, sighed the tree. I wish I could give you something, but I have nothing left. I'm just an old stump. I am sorry. I don't need very much now, said the boy. Just a quiet place to sit and rest. I'm very tired. Well, said the tree, straightening herself up as much as she could. Well, an old stump is good for sitting and resting. Come, boy, sit, sit down. Sit down and rest. And the boy did. And the tree was happy. The end. And I don't know about you, for, for me, for some strange reason, this weird little story is kind of powerful. There's something, like, really beautiful about sacrificial love. 
And there is a reason why this book is so popular. And as a follower of Jesus, I can't help but see this sacrificial love and be reminded of the way that Christ has loved us. And to me, I don't know about for you, but to me, the prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 53 is so vivid. It says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And this is sacrificial love. Because this was for you. This was for me. And Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And our, our faith is, is about one that loves us so deeply that he sacrificed everything for us, that he gave it all. And so for me, like when I read the giving tree as a follower of Jesus, I can't help but like see Jesus. But it's interesting for me because I also see myself a little bit in the boy. Because he's pretty selfish in this relationship, don't you think? Like he tends to only come to the tree when he wants something. The tree wants a relationship. Like that's it, a relationship. The boy mostly wants the tree to solve his problems. He wants money, so he takes and sells the tree's apples. He wants a house, so he cuts off the tree's branches. He wants a boat, so he cuts down the tree altogether. And this, is like, this is kind of a one-sided relationship. The tree gives and the boy takes. And really, it's the boy in this story that sets the terms of this relationship. And then the tree wants a relationship so badly that she allows the boy to dictate all the terms of the relationship. And I think, as human beings, we really like to dictate the terms of our relationships. Now, I discovered this powerfully when I was in the third grade. As an eight-year-old in uh, Mrs. Haskell's class, I had my very first crush, and her name was Brenda Epstein. And so one day I got up the nerve to send her a little note and it said, will you go with me? And there were two boxes, right? Yes and no. This was simple. And so when she gave it back to me, like I couldn't open it fast enough. Like my hands were all sweaty. Like did she mark yes or no? And guess what? Brenda added a third box. Anyone guess what the third box said? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so at recess, I tracked her down and I'm like, what? Like, what do you mean, maybe? So Brenda explained that her best friend was Nancy Jakanovich. And Nancy would feel left out if Brenda and I were exclusive. So Brenda would be my girlfriend if, and, and here were the terms of the relationship, if Nancy could be my girlfriend too. Okay? So we were an item. All three of us. <laughs> and by Christmas time, like, this thing had really escalated. It had gone next level. And so you know how elementary schools have, like, the little Santa shop? Are you guys familiar with that? You know, the little place where kids can buy cheap, stupid little Christmas gifts, and it raises money for the school or whatever? Well, so, so I, at the Santa shop, I bought, uh, I bought rings <laughs> for Brenda and Nancy. And the, the, you know, kind of retired lady in the Santa shop, she like smiled softly at me and she's like, that's so sweet. Are these like for your mom and your sister? I was like, no, man, these are for my girlfriends. <laughs> so, so Brenda and Nancy, they wore my rings for like a week and then something happened. I don't, I don't know what, it was third grade. 
But, you know, like, because this relationship was complicated. <laughs> so something happened, and they hated me, and they dumped me. And uh, just to express the full extent of their hatred for me, they took my $1 Santa shop rings, and they threw them in the woods. And uh, it was like, it was crushing. And I'm still not really over it. <laughs> but, but looking back, I, I've realized that really that relationship had no chance. It was kind of doomed from the start because three people just doesn't really work, except in Utah. <laughs> so I, I was eight at the time, and, and now I'm much older. And I've had like three decades to think about what I should have done differently. And I've concluded that I should have negotiated better terms. Uh, like if I knew then what I know now, Here's what I would have said. I would have said, you know, Brenda, you're a beautiful girl, and I think you're pretty smart, too. You already know most of your times tables, and you were a finalist in the spelling bee. But to be honest with you, like as awesome as you are, and as much as I admire your loyalty to your best friend, I'm convinced that what you're proposing is just way too complicated. I find the terms of this relationship unacceptable. It's either you alone or nothing. <laughs> now, here, here's what I've noticed. We, we live in a world where we are constantly negotiating the terms of our relationships. We do it in the dating world with boyfriends and girlfriends. We do it in friendships. We do it in marriage. We do it with our employers or our employees. But here's the thing, there's, there's one relationship where we actually do not get to dictate the terms. When it comes to our relationship with God, it, like, it has to be on his terms. And sometimes we like to think of God as sort of our own personal giving tree. And we, we wanna dictate the terms of the relationship. You know, like, God, I will come and I will uh, come to you and be with you, okay, if, like, if you answer all my questions, or if you fix this thing in my life, or if you take care of, of this problem. Like, God, I'll, I'll come to you if you answer this one prayer. God, I'll come when you meet my terms. But the truth is, if we're going to have a relationship with the God of the universe, we have to come to him on his terms. Now, this is week number three of this series that we're in called It's Personal. And for three weeks, we've been talking about the reality that God, more than anything else, wants a relationship with you and me. More than anything else, he's looking for people that will love him and trust him and walk with him. And this morning, we're going to look at God initiating a very famous relationship where we're going to see God come to a man on God's terms that God deeply wants a relationship with, but God is the one dictating the terms, and they're uncomfortable terms. Now, here's the background for this morning's story, just to get a, like a, a view for how the world was working at the time. Here's the background for this morning's story. God had created the world, but the world had largely forgotten him. The world, as it has a tendency to do, had sort of drifted from him. The world had invented its own version of God, and there was all sorts of confusion in the world about God. People mostly viewed God as some sort of cosmic vending machine. And what you had to do was figure out like how many quarters you had to put in, you know, or what type of code to punch in in order to get what it was that you wanted. You know, we need God to bless our crops. Like how do we get him to do that? And someone would come along and say, well, if you do these three things just like this, God will bless your crops. Or maybe it was, ooh, you know, I, I need God. We need God to give us more children. And so someone would come along and say, well, here's what you need to do in order to get God to give you more children. And the world was full of all this superstition. And families had their own, like, family gods. There were gods everywhere. Families had their own family gods, and pieces of real estate, little small little areas had their own specific god for that piece of real estate. Every nation, every village, every tribe had its own gods. And people thought that if they worshipped the gods in the right way, 
the right gods in the right way, that you could get that God or those gods to give you what it was that you wanted. About 4,000 years ago, okay, in the middle of all of this confusion about God, in the middle of all of these religious ideas and practices, God comes to a man named Abram, later Abraham. And he essentially says, Abraham, I, I want the world to know who I am. I, I want the world to know me and to walk with me. And, and I want to invite the world back to me. And here's the thing. I want to use you and your descendants to do it. And Abraham's going, well, that sounds pretty cool, God. But in case you haven't noticed, I don't have any descendants. In fact, more than anything else, my wife and I have wanted children, but we're old now and we've We've missed our window. My wife is well past childbearing years. So don't get me wrong, like things are still good in the romance area. But God, there are no descendants and it's too late. And so God says, well, um, trust me, I I actually know all about that. But but here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to pack up your wife and your servants and all of your stuff and move away and leave behind your old life. And the implication is, I want you to leave behind your household idols and your household gods. Leave behind all of your preconceptions about religion. I want to do something new in the world, and Abram, I'm starting with you. And let's look at this. This is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3, and here's, here's, this, here's where it happens. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, go far from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. In other words, Abraham, I'm going to do something to reach out to the whole world, because I care about the whole world. But I'm going to start with one person, and that person is is you. Abraham, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you with descendants, and those descendants are going to become this great nation. They're going to become a special nation that knows me and walks with me, and through that nation, all peoples on earth are going to be invited back to me. But make no mistake about it, I'm coming to you on my terms, and here are the terms. You have to trust me And follow me. And for now, that means just pack up and go. And that's kind of it for a while. And Abraham does what God said. And he and his wife pack up and they move. And time continues to go by. Years actually go by, but still no children. God comes to Abraham again in chapter 15. And God renews his promise. Says he took him outside and said... Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now we can kind of like gloss over that because we know where the story ends up going. But imagine you're Abraham in that moment. Abraham is old and Sarah is old. And at this point, they have zero children. And they've lived their long lives in this long marriage, wanting children more than anything else. And they'd probably done everything that their culture told them to do. They'd tried everything according to their customs and superstitions. They'd tried everything that people had said, here's what you do if you want the gods to give you a child. And they tried all of that, and none of it worked, and none of it worked. And here they were. They were still barren. And all around them, if you imagine this, people are having children. But despite all of their prayers and all of their efforts, nothing. And here comes God again, talking about his many future descendants, all of his future offspring. But in that moment, Abraham must have thought to himself, like, okay, but God, we don't have a single offspring. And this is a promise you've made before, and still there's nothing. Like, where are you? Why haven't you answered our prayers? Like, we have wanted this one thing more than anything, and now, God, it is too late. 
So can you imagine how painful all of this was for him? Can you imagine like all of the questions that must have been bubbling up in him? Which is exactly why his response to this whole thing is so amazing. Listen to this, Genesis 15, verse 6. It says, Abram believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. And I don't know about for you, but for me, it's like, wait a minute. Like, Abraham, you can't just believe. I mean, aren't there some questions? Don't you have questions like, like wait a minute, God, like how and, and where have you been and what about and why? But it says Abraham believed God. And God credited it to him as righteousness. And righteous just, righteousness just means a, a right standing with God. So in this moment, as a result of Abraham's faith, God is giving Abraham a right standing with him. Now think of this. In this moment, okay, in this time frame, there's, there's no Bible. There's no scripture. There's no Ten Commandments. There's no church. There's just Abraham and this conversation with God. And we're told that Abraham believed God, that he trusted God. And he entered into a right standing with God. God essentially says to him, Abraham, as a testimony to the rest of the world, and to start this process of inviting the world back to me, I'm going to give you, as a gift, a right standing with me. Not because of anything you've done, but because you made a decision. With all the questions that I know you have, you made a decision to simply trust me. And friends, that is all God is looking for. And you think about all the questions Abraham must have had, like, God, why now? Like, why didn't you do this earlier? Like, why have you allowed my wife to go through the humiliation and the depression and the rage? Like, there was that one time when she was late and we were like, oh, maybe. Or like, why couldn't you have delivered then? Why did you make us watch all of our friends and all of our servants and all of our neighbors with their kids when we had none? Why, like, why now? Why not sooner? Why, what, what are you doing? But, but Abraham had no answers for any of that. And in that moment, when God came to Abraham and said, I'm, I'm coming to you on my terms. Now, I, I want you to respond to me on my terms. And I know you have questions. And I know you don't understand. But I just want you to believe me. I just want you to trust me. And Abraham did. He trusted God. And God honored his promise. And Abraham had a son who had 12 grandsons. And eventually that family became the nation of Israel. And out of Israel came a man named Jesus. But nothing in this relationship with God came on Abraham's terms. He had to trust. He had to obey. He had to follow, even though he didn't understand everything. Even though he didn't get what it was that he most wanted, at least not when he wanted it. Even though he had a lot of questions, he chose to, to walk with God on God's terms. One time the disciples came to Jesus with a question. You know, Jesus had been teaching all about the, the coming kingdom. And for the most part, the disciples were like totally confused. They, like, like, like most of the people in their culture, thought that the kingdom of God would be a physical kingdom. They thought that at some point Jesus, and they weren't sure how it was all going to go, maybe he's going to call on in the angels, or maybe he's going to raise up an army, but, but somehow they were going to overthrow the oppression of the Romans, and they would, they would become their own kingdom again. And every time Jesus talked about the kingdom, they had these visions of it, like a palace somewhere and being with King Jesus. And of course, for them, that meant they'd be in the king's inner circle. And in their culture, right, a person's rank was very important. And Jesus had already talked about the reality that some people would be called least in the kingdom and other people would be called great in the kingdom. And so the disciples, as human as they were, were looking around at each other going, okay, when this, thing, like when this kingdom thing actually goes down, like, how am I going to stack up? And this question was fueled by some other things that were going on. Just recently, Peter, James, and John had gone on this trip with Jesus. Like, none of the other disciples got to go, just those three. 
And they went up a mountain, and the other disciples weren't invited. And when they got back, no one would talk about it. Like, I imagine the other disciples felt a little weird about that. Also, Jesus had been talking frequently about the reality that he's going to die. He kept saying, like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And so you, you kind of wonder if the disciples were thinking, you know, when King Jesus dies, like, someone else has to become king. And I'm guessing that no one dared say it out loud, but maybe they wondered. They're looking around at each other going, who will it be? So they come to Jesus with an extremely relevant and important question. They want to know the hierarchy. And this is Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now imagine the drama of that moment. They're expecting Jesus to like name a name. You know, maybe Jesus would do it like, like a beauty contest. Well, the fifth runner-up is, you know, and that guy gets called up and has to smile like, I'm so happy to be the fifth runner-up. <laughs> they don't know what Jesus is going to say. But imagine the anticipation, because like if Jesus says something, this is, this is huge. So they're on pins and needles, and here's what happens. Verse 2, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. So they're all like leaning in for the answer. And Jesus says, oh, hey, little buddy. Yeah, you right there. Like, hey, would you come up here for a second? I know, like, I know you're kind of shy, but come on up here for a second. And the disciples are, are going, uh, excuse us, little boy. Uh, we're in the middle of a very important conversation with Jesus. And so, uh, Jesus, maybe you didn't hear the question. We'll, we'll repeat it. Uh, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And so with this little boy standing right there, verses 3 and 4, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying it's, it's all about humility and trust. It all comes down to this. Trust God. Trust him the way a five-year-old trusts their parent. Trust that he knows more than you. I mean, imagine this. God knows more than you. Trust that he knows better than you. That he loves you and he wants good things for you. That even if things don't make perfect sense to you, he actually knows what he's doing. So follow and trust and obey, Jesus says, like a child. And here's, I think, a huge part of what Jesus is getting at. Built into our resistance to God, and, and we're all resistant at times, right? Built into that resistance is this, sometimes this subtle thread of pride. This thread of pride that runs through us. And if we were to like peel back the layers, the pride looks a little bit like this. God, you owe me. You owe me an explanation for why you let that happen in my life. God, you owe me. You owe me an answer to my prayer. I've been, I've been faithful to you. Well, mostly faithful. Well, I haven't killed anybody. And I go to church and stuff. So you owe me. You owe me that job. You, you owe me a pregnancy. You owe me a romantic relationship. You owe me a better house, a better career. You owe me better health. God, you owe it to me to sit at my bargaining table and agree to my terms for our relationship. I have stuff that I want. And as far as I can tell, it's really good stuff. So here are my terms. You give me what I want, and I'll follow you. Like, those are the terms. But see, God doesn't, God doesn't, doesn't operate like that. If we want a relationship with him, we have to come to him on his terms. And his terms are this. I love you more than you can possibly imagine. I love you so much that I sent my son to die a sacrificial death for you to set you free from all of your guilt. I'm offering to walk through your life. And even though you won't perceive me all the time, I'm offering, if you trust me and walk with me, to pour my blessing out on you. And so then we say, well, okay, 
but what, what does that blessing look like? Like, will you give me a great job? Will, will, you, will you hook me up with my soulmate? Can you, can, you, can you make my soulmate hot? God, how exactly will you bless me? Will you make me smart and successful and liked and admired by everybody? I mean, how exactly will you bless me? God, let's, let's talk more about the terms of this deal. And God says, you're, you, you're just going to have to trust me on this. I, wanna, I want a relationship. And if you want a relationship with me, it'll be on my terms. I will bless you. Your job is to trust me. And here's something else. If you trust me and come to me on these terms, then one day when this life is a distant memory, you and I will see each other face to face. And you'll understand what you can't possibly understand right now. And so for now, you just need to trust me. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to lead you, but you have to trust me. And these are my terms. And I think the question that, that's facing every one of us at certain times is simply this. Like, will I, will I back away from the negotiating table and simply trust God? Am I willing to come to him on his terms? Will I trust that, like, maybe God knows what he's doing? Will I, will I, am I willing to trust him with a childlike faith? And maybe if you're here this morning and you're honest, maybe for you, there's more of sort of this giving tree relationship thing going on with you and God. You come to him when you've got a problem and you need help, when you need something. And you want to know all the time, like, okay, but what's in this for me exactly? And so I just want to pause this morning and ask all of us to consider something. What if, what if God is trying to do something in your life that is so deep and so beautiful, but it doesn't necessarily involve you getting everything that you want? What if the main point of all of it is just him? Like, what if at the end of it all, the main prize is, the big prize in all of it is it's him. It's not everything you want him to do for you. It's, it's ultimately just him. And if, if that turns, what if that turns out to be more beautiful than anything that you're currently possibly imagining? What if that turns out to be way bigger than all of the stuff that you want? What if, like, when you meet him face to face one day, what if, like, in that moment, it all makes sense.